And we're live. So welcome everyone to the first episode of um, Remote Engineering War Stories. Today, um, we're joined by Gonçalo Silva, amazing CTO at Doist. And uh, the purpose for this uh, show is essentially for us to discuss those interesting and the nitty gritty of uh, all the things that happen and behind the amazing blog posts that you read online and all the neat and uh, uh, things that you hear about great teams doing great things and they somehow always get it perfectly fine at, at, at the first time. And we're here to just discuss the opposite uh, in a few episodes until um, this explodes or people stop showing up. Anyway, so Gonzalo, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to do the, you know, anti-fluffy blog post. <laughs> you know, what, what's on the other side of the camera? <laughs> nice. So, uh, Gonzalo, um, we'll start with a few baseline questions, just mm -hmm. so that everyone knows um, who they're talking and who they're hearing um, and uh, mm -hmm. where we come from. So, Gonzalo, I have uh, five questions. They may not be 100% easy, but let's go as fast <laughs> as we can so that people yeah. really know who they're listening to. All well, right, let's do it. All right, yep. first one, quick intro about yourself, go. So my name is Gonzalo. I'm an engineer at heart. Uh, computers are the thing that I've loved the most since I you know, can remember for, from all of the things we could be doing in life. Uh, I've been working remotely for over a decade and I've been CTO at Duis now for four years, I think, roughly. So yeah, that's a very quick intro. Nice. Thank you. Second mm -hmm. one. So what are the things that you currently do on your day to day and spend time on as CTO at Duist? So uh, my role right now is very much about kind of like being the glue between our different teams. So we are structured into functions. We're a functional organization. Uh, this gains us a lot of speed and a lot of expertise in specific domains, but does break a little bit the kind of like the high cohesion of a larger engineering team. So a lot of my role, besides, I guess, most people understand the strategy and vision parts of it on a day to day basis, is also to play that glue and kind of like bring people together and put them working together. Awesome. What do you enjoy doing the most? Oh, uh, OK. You said this wasn't going to be easy. so. <laughs> There are a lot of things I enjoy, but I think I have the most fun where I'm when I'm building things with technology. Not necessarily by myself, could be just be supporting the team that's doing this, but I think technology is just such a big enabler in the world. And I just, I mean, I want to be a part of it all. Nice. Um, what's your take on remote engineering teams? I'm unsure how people did uh, build, you know, teams before. Like, I'm unsure why you would put people in a place. I'm unsure why you would kind of like limit yourself to such a small pool of individuals. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot to gain from being uh, diverse, from working with people from all across the world with very different cultures, very different ideas. I think this creates a sort of like a very, very healthy tension where everybody kind of like is better and learns a lot. Uh, so. That is my take. It's really like, why isn't everybody doing this? I'm nice. not sure. <laughs> and now the last question for the baseline. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you define failure? Oh, OK. Yes. <laughs> failure. So I think failure, ultimately, it's when things don't go the way we planned. So you know, I think if you. So let's say you plan to do something in a certain way, but things don't go according to plan, either because of how they play out or by you know random chance. That probably could be a descriptor of failure. I guess you can see this in many different ways. Uh, but above everything else, uh, when things don't go according to plan, it's always a learning opportunity. So there's also that side of it. You know, Failure leads to learning and ultimately to growth. So on the spot, because I did not have access to these questions beforehand, I would probably define failure as when things don't go as you had planned them to. Awesome. Thank you. All right, baseline is done. So mm -hmm. everyone knows uh, what we're about. OK, mm -hmm. we're going to move on to more like a, uh, those hard topics and things that brought us here today. I just want to remind everyone that it can send questions. Uh, we'll be discussing this um, uh, lively. and. Um, and just drop any questions, whatever you are um, uh, tuning in, um, and we'll, we'll address them. Um, mm -hmm. So let's move on to more interesting things. 
Um, you, uh, you're you working for Duist. Duist is a builder of uh, and responsible for amazing apps that everyone uses and that are often featured in uh, certain very public places and like very well-known brands, which is awesome. So kudos to all of you. Thank you. Um, of course, this doesn't come uh, easily, uh, of course, it is, it's, <laughs> as an understatement. Um, and, and there's always a journey behind um, big teams, successes, and, and, and it's always like uh, uphill, downhill, uphill, downhill. But at some point throughout the, your history and your story, um, there's always that one tipping point. Right? There's always that moment where um, mm. it essentially, it almost uh, brought you close to the rupture. Uh, or or your breaking yeah. point, and then somehow you you, you step out of it, right? You, be it as a contributor or as, as manager, um, but mm -hmm. there it, there's always a tipping point. What was it? The tipping point. That's an interesting question. So um, it's actually hard for me to put a finger on one moment, but I think overall. So can I can I name two maybe? Because yeah, one, whatever works, whatever works. Yeah. So, so there's there's one I think on the technical side of things that's that happened very early on, uh, actually on my master's thesis. Uh, so, I think I did pretty well there, and one of the reasons was that I I took what I was doing all the way. So I was working on um, uh, performance optimization of Rails apps, and so. I didn't just do some lightweight investigation. I was talking to the people who are actually doing the work. I was, uh, you know, getting my hands dirty with the Ruby interpreter and all of the profiling tools available. I was kind of like, kind of like trying to go everywhere that was meaningful around performance. So when I delivered this, the the work, uh, I think a lot of people noticed how thorough it was, and it was like one of the first pieces of public work I was delivering. And I think that set up. On the, on the technical side of things, that set up my career to be um, for folks to see me as somebody who's very meticulous and thorough. And that was, you know, it's nice to live by that image. It also forces yeah. me to be better. Uh, now, on the management and leadership side of things, it's actually quite a fun story. So uh, at Duist in the beginning, there were no kind of managers or anything. We were just people doing things. And this was true for a long time. Um, when we were hiring the third Android developer for the team, Amir, our founder, said, hey, Gonzalo, uh, you know, now we need leadership for the team, and I think you would be a great fit for this. And I distinctively you know, recall uh, replying back to this saying, what? Are you insane? We don't need leadership in this team. We're just three people. So I ended up taking on the role very reluctantly in the beginning. Um, but yeah, I mean, it ended up being a great experience. Uh, I think we built a really strong, a great team, and that did spark my interest in, you know, what if I could do this in a, an even bigger scale, you know, and and so on and so on. So, I How think those two moments. Today? Well, we're almost fifty engineers, so yeah. Uh, yeah. worked out well. Yeah, I'd say so. Good. Um, you know what is is uh, of course what we see every day, and 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 especially. Um, a lot of people ask, literally everyone can have access to what you do, uh, what your team does. Mm -hmm. And and behind it, what we see is something amazing, something works flawlessly. Um, can, can you share uh, something about like uh, those, holy shit, we're going to die or uh, <laughs> it's going to break so bad? Yep, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's quite interesting because when you invited me to do this, I thought, yeah, man, my memory is so bad. I don't know if I can do a good job. But then I sit and think for like 10 seconds and I have like 10 <laughs> examples. So, <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> so um, maybe going from the present to the past uh, could be a way. So yeah, absolutely. So right now we're kind of dealing with a Phoenix project. I don't know if uh, many people have read this book. If not, I highly recommend it. It's fun. And I, I would say we have one on our hands. Uh, so one of the things we did earlier on that got to do is to find some escape velocity and some strong growth was adding sharing. So we added light collaboration into the product. But we did it in probably the worst possible way if we were ever going to uh, reinvest in this. So the way sharing works in Todoist is, you know, you, right now you share a project with your, your, you know, your spouse or a colleague. It all seems very seamless, but actually behind the scenes we're copying things, 
and synchronizing them manually. I know, hindsight 2020, that sounds horrible. It made sense at the time. Uh, the problem is, over the last five years or so, every time we wanted to you know, do more things around sharing, we never could because this system is unsustainable. unsustainable. It doesn't scale at all. Uh, and the problem is, Todoist grew so much and it has so much data that any kind of mass migration is daunting. Like, how do we even do this? Um, so that was mistake number one. Mistake number two was how do we tackle this project? So we had uh, somebody on the team who's been with us for a very long time and designed a lot of these systems that was very eager to do this. And we were like, awesome, take the project, have fun, you know, let's circle back in three months. And <laughs> so, you know, three months later, we delayed the deadline for three months more. Uh, that was about a year ago. And we haven't shipped yet. So we're still kind of figuring out how complex, you know, a strong schema migration can be, especially at scale, uh, based on poor decisions we made in the past. Of course, I mean, with good intent, it's not like we rushed anything. It just felt like with the data we had and the goals we had, that felt like the best approach uh, turned out not to be. So, of course, right now we have a much stronger team working on this project. There's three people, which for us, it's a lot. We tend to work very independently. There's a lot more structure and we're a lot closer to shipping. So we have some visibility. But in the end, you know, just a small decision five years ago has cost us, you know, over one year of work, failed deadlines, a lot of stress. Uh, you know, even the team working on this speaks fairly often that, you know, if they make one mistake, uh, of course, we have safety mechanisms in place, but it's very stressful. We're dealing with billions and billions of tasks uh, and, you know, millions of projects. It's just insane how much data we're migrating. So, yeah, I guess that is a very actual story. <laughs> it's happening right now. Yeah. Do, do you feel like um, uh, you're able to... Um, get the appropriate lessons from it uh, or do you feel like you have to uh, let it land and then take a while until like uh, is it something that the team mm. is able to learn from continuously or is it like we're going to land this first and then we're going to stop and look back and, and see what honestly i think both because there are learnings that you can take out of things as they happen, especially with a long-term project like this, right? As I mentioned, we've been at this for a year. So hopefully there were a few obvious things that popped up. Uh, I think the move from one individual lone wolf, like doing everything, uh, to having a structured team with you know a lot more structure around it, deliverables and so on, was already something we learned that you know it was another mistake we made. Um, but I definitely think that Pulling things through to the end, letting it rest a little bit, and then doing a reflection is also super valuable because a lot of things won't be obvious in the heat of the moment. Um, and so I definitely think there's room for both. Yeah. yeah. Well, it makes sense. One of, I mean, one of the truths that you, you end up learning the hard way as a manager is that things like this happen. And uh, even though people tend to think, well, if you do all things right, it will all go well. When, well, it's not true, right? These things are part of the process. Um, you don't know what you don't know. And uh, what have you learned as, as a manager with your experience in, in as professional at the first place? Mm -hmm. um, when you're going to, because these projects will happen again, right? Yes. Uh, you don't, you, you can avoid them, but you probably can contain them somehow. Mm -hmm. um, what, what would you say is, the best approach in your experience and, and your context as well to deal with those in the future, knowing that they will happen. Yeah. So the first thing that I think we've learned is to do the opposite of what we did. So instead of picking up a large project, putting it in the hands of someone very capable, but isolated and saying good luck. So I think the first thing we need to do is just make the plan and the goals very explicit, probably shared with many people. Uh, so, you know, not, maybe not make things as independent as we usually do for smaller things. Um, another one is just relying on, you know, what's out there, what's known. We have, you know, Dora's four metrics, for example. One of them is deployment frequency. I think right now, if I were to take on any other major project, I would definitely set some kind of, you know, shipping recurrence that's very active. Even if it's a big project, lots of things changing, sure. What are we going to ship this week? And make sure we are delivering and moving the needle every week closer and closer and closer. Um, 
I think that's super important for many reasons, uh, for creating momentum, for keeping, you know, large projects tend to bog us down because we sometimes we feel like we're not moving, but if we're shipping every week, we're going to fight this psychological thing about large projects. We also have some notion of velocity, which we can use to make predictions. They will suck and we'll be wrong, but it's much better than putting the finger up in the air and seeing where the wind is blowing, right? So ultimately, I think those two takeaways, number one, making it a thing. It's a thing. So let's make it a thing, right? It's something that needs structure. It needs people around it. It needs uh, a good plan. It needs a plan, basically, a good plan. And a good plan doesn't need to be right. It just needs to be thorough. Um, and second, just follow best practices. So I, I know that sometimes when we're taking on very big changes, we tend to say, you know, first, you know, V1 or V0, first draft in three months. Yeah, nope, don't do that. I think that's setting things up for failure. Uh, that's setting things up for uh, frustration, frustrating everybody around the project. So it's a little bit harder, but figuring out what are you going to ship next week that will move us closer to that future can make a night and day difference when tackling big projects. Yeah, now yeah, for sure. That's 100% true. Well, someone uh, commented, doesn't everything mm -hmm. in tech not go as according to plan? So uh, what's, <laughs> what's your take on uh, this beautiful manifestation of the Murphy's Law? <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's not not true, right? Like it, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, it's true. But at the same time, I think there's varying degrees of things not going according to plan. Sometimes they go better than you planned them to. Uh, I'm, I'm sure this has happened to a lot of people. I tend to be an optimist, but I think, you know, even in failure, I'm usually just looking for the learnings. Uh, so something you mentioned before, you mentioned this will happen again, right? Like a big project will come up, some things will go wrong. Honestly, the thing that gets me really excited about how poorly we handled this one was I think we're going to be in a such a, you know, so much better position next time around. We've learned so much out of this that we're going to make different mistakes and we're going to learn from them too. But we're definitely not going to be as amateur about it next time around. And that really excites me. And I would rather spend most of my time in the joy of learning and being better than before than lamenting what we did and why we did it. Uh, so, yeah, I think the fact that a lot of things in tech go wrong. Uh, or not according to plan, I mean, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It also means we're learning all the time and growing. And I think that's one of the reasons why tech is such a vibrant sector compared to many of the others, which have already went through this rapid iterations and figuring out what good looks like. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, 100%. Um, and and one of the things we, we keep discussing and, and it keeps popping up um, is the fact that things that require planning and they require um, understanding, um, sometimes over communication and, 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 mm -hmm. um, and good teams. Mm -hmm. um, this, this brings me more into like management stuff, uh, like uh, um, dealing with people because project may be whatever it is, but um, at the end of the day, it's built by people, right? uh, people yeah. that uh, were entrusted uh, with this and, and, in, in, in your case, in our case as well, it's everyone is remotely and right? you have a team distributed uh, all across the world. And that brings you like um, tackling with big projects with big stakes uh, at the same time that you're tackling uh, people and, and people's dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> what, it, 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 on the people side of things, uh, what, what have you learned that, that works um, not so great, uh, be it the small projects or big projects like this, like things that you'd avoid going forward. Yeah. Um, so people are, you know, just the human side of it all is the most wonderful thing, I think, because, you know, with more people, you just can do things you could never do by yourself. So it's, 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 I just want to make that, that preface because I think sometimes we, we, especially folks in our roles tend to be very opinionated and kind of like doing things my way or the highway. And I think that's detrimental to the true potential of what it means, you know, having a group of people doing something together. So something I learned, it's really about around this, uh, around this idea of, 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 you know, fighting against the my way or the highway. So, so for example, 
I think it's a lot more important that a team is um, aligned on the direction than me setting that direction. So one example I can give, and I guess this goes into the war stories, a lot of our technical stack at Duist is really low on my preference list. I don't enjoy most of the languages we use. I don't. It's it's kind of like I would pick literally and almost everything else, and that's okay, because the folks that are actually doing the work have great reasons to pick the te the, the tech stacks that they did, uh, and they're excited about them and those choices and the challenges they bring and the benefits. So, I could really make a great case why you know, picking X is really not the best choice. I can I can I, I I'm pretty confident I could win this argument, but do I want to? Not really. I don't think I gain anything from this other than the feels good moment and then forcing everybody doing the actual work to yeah. you know, use something they don't enjoy. So this was a learning I think I had along the way, which uh, obviously uh, I have strong opinions. I think a lot of people that go up in leadership roles do. Um, but maybe in the very, very early beginnings, I thought, yay, this is nice. Now I get to set the direction more strongly and so on. And like, actually, it turns out that's a tool we can use, but it's probably not a tool we use every day or very often because you know uh, we need to let the other people shine through and you know have their takes and collaborate. So that was learning, you know, being yeah. more of an enabler than a direction setter in a way. Actually, it's quite connected to something that someone just asked. Um, it, mm -hmm. it is at the end of the day, you have to make a lot of decisions, and the people that you work with also have to make a lot of decisions. Yeah. And and in a fully remote, remote and distributed team, you end up often to um, make things go and 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 pick between A and B or help the team pick between A and B. Mm -hmm. um, what's the worst that happens when you don't? And uh, what learning learnings have you have, have you drawn for from these sort of scenarios? Hmm. I mean, the worst that happens is uh, actually going. Think of a boat. You could argue that going downstream or going upstream uh, is better, right? But the thing you really don't want is people rowing in different directions and the boat doesn't move. That means you're, you're sitting static, you're burning money and time and energy and really not moving the needle. So I think ultimately it's true that a lot of people have to make decisions. Um, the way I like to think about it is that we need to align on the overall direction and the overall vision of what we want to do, how we want to do it, and who we want to be while we're doing it. So I tend to see these things through the lenses of values. You could you could call them core values. You could call them engineering values. It could be a mix of the two. But those are the areas where I really want my teams to be aligned on. You know, this is These are the things we care about. Because then the specific decisions, not all, but most of them, should not go into a stale situation because you know even if you're blocked you can say okay what do the values say and pick that so ultimately i think the place where it really goes wrong in my experience is when you don't have a very you know explicit direction and that means that folks will do different things uh and you might even go into this situation where you have this tension of you know, somebody doesn't disagree with the, doesn't agree with the direction, uh, you know, a conversation took. But since there is not a clear decision that is kind of like made by everybody in the group, um, they do it some other way because that's fine. That's what they prefer. And then you're kind of like unconsciously, and really this, this, this happens unconsciously, but you're unconsciously undermining the collective effort of everybody else. So I think it's really important to avoid these situations and, uh, the key thing here is to just be very clear about the decisions that are being made and the direction that we're overall taking. And I think values is a really good way to frame all of this discussion. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, w w w I want to go slightly on a tangent, a tangent and, and someone asking them, has mm -hmm. uh, Duist ever always been uh, remote? Uh, so yes and kind of. Okay. <laughs> so the reason to explain this, uh, Duist started without any kind of structure. I feel like a lot of companies nowadays begin and, you know, they have a name and they have a logo and they have a five-year plan and, you know, they know who they want to be and so on. And Duist was a side project from Amir in the beginning. Uh, 
uh, Amir had an amazing insight in early 2010, 2011, that mobile was going to be a huge thing. So, you know, he wanted to expand his side project at the time. It was actually focusing more on something else called We Doist, which is dead nowadays. Um, so at that time, things were very, very remote because most people working were freelancers. That's as remote as you can get, right? So yeah. um, a lot of the early people were those freelancers that got hired. Uh, and I actually have a nice story about this if we want to go there. Um, yeah. And so that was very remote from the beginning, but very unstructured. And, but the thing to note was sometimes networks come into play. And for example, I was fortunate to be able to bring a lot of my immediate network into this. So we needed a designer. There was this amazing designer I knew, which happened to be available. I talked to her. She was on the fence, but eventually she joined. We needed an iOS developer. There was this like hugely talented guy I had worked with before who had been my manager, actually. Uh, I talked to him. He was on his way to submit papers for his PhD. He eventually decided not to come and join us. And here we are today. So what happens with networks is that sometimes it breaks the whole fully distributed thing. And in the beginning, there were a lot of folks from Portugal, from Porto specifically. Yeah. And Amir, uh, he was in Chile, but it was a temporary thing and he didn't know where to go next. So he came to Porto. Like a lot of my team is there. Why not? Uh, so I would say that for a, a couple of years, Doist was fully remote. We had people in other continents, in many other countries, but there was significant mass in Porto, and it even caused a few problems where, mm. you know, uh, again, we didn't do things very structured in the beginning. So thinking about, you know, everything should be transparent, everything should be explicit, blah, 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 blah. These are things you think a lot about now, but actually they come as learnings from not doing that and then sensing the frustration in, in other folks who were not here and thinking, oh man, they are absolutely right. Like we need to avoid this in the future. Um, so so yeah, Doist was always remote, but maybe it was not always for all of its life as fully distributed as it is now. There was a stage there where there was maybe a third of the company in, uh, in Portugal, which does skew things a bit, especially since we didn't have that structure. It, uh, from from what I hear, it sounds like um, you went from sort of async to almost sync and uh, async <laughs> first. Uh, what was there any like very important thing or group of things that happened that kind of pushed you into realizing this? Look, this is not the right direction. Oh, absolutely. Uh, because it was accidental. So the thing that happened was we continued to use WeDoist at the time, which was already an asynchronous communication tool. So we never really steered away from that. But, you know, it was maybe easy to just have a meeting with somebody, make a decision, and then announce that decision. And you didn't have that step of, you know, explaining the problem, having other people weigh in before you make a decision. So this process didn't happen in the open. And what ha what happened to us was this generated frustration. Like, you know, people saw the decision, they didn't saw all of the context, all of the conversation that just happened to happen in person and so on. Uh, not even notes, meeting notes. Why would you have those? It's so much easier to talk face to face, right? So the, the tipping point was the growing frustration from people who saw these outcomes and they called them out. They would say like, you know, guys, this is not cool. Like, I don't understand how we got here. Um, and our realization that everybody was right and this easy, kind of like maybe too easy way of working was wrong and unproductive. So the first step we took was to stop having in-person meetings. So people in Porto would meet over their computer, literally, and do the same workflow as with everybody else. And eventually the team just grew. Amir moved out. He went to Spain. Uh, and so there was a lot of more people from everywhere else. So this was became no longer a problem, but yeah. Nice. Um, so imagine you're, I were to like magically grab you and drop you in um, this bizarre world where mm. Doist is in an office. Um, whatever. Mm. You can pick the CD. Uh, I'll, I'll allow you that. <laughs> uh, merciful God. Um, and you're dropped there and everyone knows you. Same team, same everything. But now mm -hmm. you're all in an office. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> what, what what do you do besides screaming and freaking out? Um, in terms of your day-to-day -day work, um, what what would you try to ensure 
knowing that you can't explain people, you all need to run home. Like you're in an office, you can't change that status quo. But mm -hmm. what would you tackle? So first of all, I would be extremely happy because because of the pandemic, I haven't seen my coworkers in almost two years. So you know, just having everybody in the same room where we could you know chat and celebrate and have you know a drink <laughs> would be amazing. Yes. But after that, you know, when it starts sinking in, oh no, <laughs> what happened? <laughs> I think the 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 first thing uh, I would do is focus on the fundamentals, the first principles. So. So, for example, I do think that asynchronous communication is a bigger revolution than remote, honestly. And in, in your example, I would have my worldwide team in an office. So they're already worldwide. They're already, you know, some of the best in the field, some of the most amazing people that apply to our position. So we're already cheating in this story, right? Because uh, we're not limited. They already, have, <laughs> they already have perspective, their own culture, their own value add, which is fairly unique. So... I think the 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 first thing I would focus on is how we communicate because if you have everybody in the office again it's very easy to just talk to your teammate next you know in the next chair uh, just have a lot of uh, one on one meetings and decide things and that that would be my first focus for sure just making sure we have some kind of uh, system or a workflow or a tool where most of the communication happens and we all adopt some kind of um, mentality of you know if it's not there it didn't happen. Um, because I think that's one of the most fundamental steps into creating uh, a system where nobody, it's kind of like very fair for everybody uh, and there's a lot of documentation. People can be very independent and autonomous because they have access to information and so on. Um, so yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm unsure if that's a good answer, but communication would definitely be... Do you think you'd be topic. able to reach the same level of, of success um, with the team, uh, with the product? In that scope, or do no, you feel like you're like no, 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 no. I mean, I think in the beginning, maybe if people get excited, hey, finally we're together. Because again, like especially now with the pandemic, I feel like people miss being together. So that yeah. would be nice, and maybe it would spark some brainstorms and some serendipity, which remote can be tricky to bring serendipity into remote, right? So, but otherwise, absolutely not. Like, I think the fact that we get to work where we want, how we want, using whatever schedule we want really brings out the best in us. I really think that the constraints are virtuous. For example, the fact that I have teammates in almost all time zones, that forces me to communicate asynchronously, that forces me to think about things before replying. So it kind of like breaks that real time feeling of communication, brings out the best version in me. How many times have I read something? I wanted to reply something specific, but I let it sit for a day or maybe even just a couple hours. And the second version is just so much better, much higher signal, uh, and everybody benefits from this. Um, and I think in an office, this would be very hard to replicate uh, because, again, like most people would have a similar schedule. They're in the similar time zone. They would work from the same place. So there wouldn't be many constraints there. So no, I absolutely think that the distributed part of remote is fundamental to, you know, being as productive and as, and the work itself being so high quality as I perceive it to be for most remote companies. Yeah. Good. Um, <laughs> one, one of the reasons why uh, this is called war stories is because mm -hmm. I mean, often when uh, engineering teams or leaders or managers they get together they, or a coffee chat or virtual coffee chat eventually talk about all these things they, they did it and sometimes some things you brag about some things you're like oh, i'm not gonna talk about it or some things <laughs> they make you cry in the shower uh, so yeah it, it is what it is but <laughs> how how much of it so it it's all part of life right? mm -hmm. some things some more stories are good uh, they all eventually add up to life stories and uh, what would you say no more on the tech side of things um how much of it, how much of war life stories um, is related to technical debt? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, a lot of it, right? I, I think because technical debt, ultimately, it's a decision. <laughs> Whether we make it explicitly or not, it's a decision, right? And a lot of these war stories stem from decisions we made. So I would definitely 
relate the two in terms of, you know, it's the decision that leads to technical debt. It's the decision that leads to a war story later on. So not all of them, but I think there's definitely a strong correlation there. But at the same time, technical debt is such a useful tool. I think that the, the biggest problem with technical debt is when we use it unknowingly. So we kind of like just <laughs> not think much about it, not have a plan, not realize what we're doing, uh, which happens a lot, by the way. We are we tend to be ambitious. We tend to estimate poorly. Even when we estimate poorly, we tend to go and rush and try to meet the deadline. You know, our industry is known for the crunch, which is uh, ridiculous. Um, yes. <laughs> so, you know, in the end, all of these decisions, they, they do compound into the war stories because war stories are when things break, right? Uh, which uh, come from many events and other decisions in the past. So definitely, I think um, technical debt can be uh, a good, you know, a reasonable source of these war stories. But I also think sometimes it's, uh, the people. So, if I if we can go back a little bit, just to share like another specific story. I mentioned when I freelanced for Doist in the beginning, and I have this kind of like war story of remote, in this case freelancing. I guess that counts. Um, yeah. Where I was extremely underpaid for about a year, and it was all my fault. <laughs> so basically, <laughs> so here's the story. Uh, we i was building a product with a friend and we wanted to you know make something cool but we had been doing that for over a year uh and we were literally running out of cash so we needed some money so we decided to take on a job and amir came around, came around you know to build a to-do list android app at that time um the thing was um we had only built one android app so we didn't have a lot of experience and the landscape was changing a lot so when it came time to you know do you know write a quote for the for the work we did it in a not very structured way and then obviously amir negotiated back and we accepted because you know the work seemed cool and we needed the cash uh and then we also forgot there were two of us <laughs> which looking back <laughs> it's super you know it's just ridiculous so in the end we had an unreasonable quote that yes. was negotiated down and cut in half <laughs> <laughs> for around nine months of work. And I remember my my wife, then girlfriend, saying, What are you doing? Like, I know you I know you're enjoying, but like this is less than the minimum wage. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, and th this was not technical debt. It was just yeah. like, you know, excitement and ambition and just not doing things very thoroughly. This goes against the technical thing I mentioned yeah. before, by the way. So <laughs> so yeah. So yeah, sometimes you know, these war stories come from poor decision making right off the bat. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, someone asks uh, either remote or do is to have something like a fail wall uh, where you post or talk about fail stuff that happened in the past. Um, and remote, I can say we don't, we don't really look a lot into the past. We try to learn as we go um, and we learn all we can and we move forward. Um, how about you guys do is? Neither. We have an incidents channel where we document any incidents that happen. Uh, we do have a step in our incident response plan, which is to revisit past related incidents and try to learn from them. It's a step that uh, it's one of the few steps that I think people usually don't <laughs> really follow. And there have been some discussions of, you know, this is not super useful in the heat of the moment. So and that's very tactical, right? Like uh, responding to an incident. So uh, we don't look into the past either. So we just tend to focus on the future and the learnings and how we're going to apply the learnings, which is very forward facing by default. Yeah. Now, if we shift from the past into the future, same timeline, mm -hmm. um, I mean, remote and, and, and do is kind of are, are in, in a space that a lot of people call a future of work. Uh, not just because of the way we do, the services that we do and provide. Um, this comes with a price. The fact that you're working on something hip, uh, trendy area, something you can brag about, but also uh, a lot of people don't get where the world is going. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of companies are, even recent companies are still stuck um, in the old ways using same old processes and um, because it kind of works for them or they think it works for them. Mm -hmm. 
in in your in your I mean in your experience, the things that you amounted uh, you, you, you went through in your life, professional life. Mm -hmm. What aren't people getting about the 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 current mm -hmm. movement? Yes, about about future of work, about where we're going as mm -hmm. okay, society, what are and what 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 don't people yeah, get? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think something that immediately comes to mind is trust. I don't think people understand that the, 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 the direction we're headed is one where uh, there is more trust at work. Um, I think this shows in many ways, like um, let's, for example, in the beginning of the year, <clears throat> I did quite a few office hours, beginning of last year, I did quite a few office hours when the pandemic hit because a lot of people were starting to work remotely they had a lot of questions and I wanted to, you know, do my best to help. Um, and it's interesting, like how many different conversations I had, which were about control. And it was also interesting how honestly I struggled to convey the idea that we need to separate ourselves from those, uh, from that. If we want to do great work, we need more trust. We need more, you know, we need accountability through trust, not through control. And I really, really don't think this is um, changing as quickly as I would love to. So this, we still see this every day on Twitter. We still see this uh, every day when some folks complain about remote work. Uh, either the employee that gets monitored somehow, which is, again, that should be just illegal. Uh, or, uh, you know, the manager who says, oh, but I don't know what my team is doing. How can I support them? Nice. <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice framing, right? So... Yeah. I am very concerned about this because I do think that for remote work to shine, you need a lot of trust. You need systems that rely on trust. And I think this is really getting in the way of uh, humans, you know, just moving in this direction and figuring this out. Is there, is, is, is there something you would urge people um, to do or to think about in order to move faster in that direction? Yes, I think I think ultimately we need to understand that control is a structure that does not scale. Um, and you know you can force things, but then everybody's life will be a little bit more miserable. Also, just the understanding that a lot of people bring very important things to the table, and we need to let them, not control them. Um, also to understand that work is about outcomes and like the things we just build and put out, not necessarily about how every step of the way we're doing things. So maybe aligning on the outcomes and the goals is a lot more important than just monitoring and controlling how the, each step is being done. Um, but we have a great blog post on this, uh, by the way, on our blog. So uh, nice. about how trust is what makes remote, you know, what makes teams stick. And I would highly recommend everybody who's interested on this topic or who wants to convince somebody else to become more interested on this topic to share because that one has a lot of great points and some research behind it too. So Good. Yeah. Where, where can people find this? In our blog. So blog.doist.com. We call it ambition and balance. <clears throat> There's a search bar. If you search for trust, I'm pretty sure that's going to be the number one hit. So yeah. Good. Nice. So you know people where you go to for this kind of, mm -hmm. uh, kind of material. Um, and it, this also means that a lot of the key skills that we, we, we used to get as granted um, when working in an office, becoming a leader, becoming a manager, working on a team, working on a distributed team, either near shore or whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. it, 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 it required certain kinds of skills. Now we... we we're moving towards a completely different uh, world and with completely different requirements and how to deal with people. Um, you mentioned trust. And I remember the first times that I applied to a job way back when I was like, it, that, what do you mean trust? You have to be here. We have to look at you working. And um, yep. so we, it also means that we're shaping up uh, new people towards new ideals and, and uh, what are the new ideals? What are the new skills uh, for mm -hmm. tomorrow's uh, team leaders, managers, um, uh, people that in, 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 that don't manage anyone but have the responsibility to work in a team and represent a part of their 
code base or the project, something like this. Yeah, uh, that is an excellent question. So I think trust is very important, but we already covered that. Um, something that's becoming increasingly um, clear is that communication is key. How well you write specifically, how well you are able to articulate your ideas is a very, very important skill. And you could argue that this was already the case in the past, but I feel that with remote, you know, with re with remote work, with uh, that all of the brilliant tools that are coming out that support remote work, people are a lot more interconnected. So before, maybe you had a team of a hundred people in an office, you know, in cubicles, but people had a very small network. There were these areas; they were very self-contained, and there was not kind of this like more hive mind where people actually collaborate across boundaries and they communicate. So now people are communicating much more openly. There needs to be more transparency, more documentation about everything that's happening. And so that puts some pressure on the communication skills that people have. And I would definitely recommend anybody uh, going into remote or thinking about going into remote to invest in this, like just improving how they communicate, how they write specifically. I think it's the most important of them all um, because that's, that's compounding like we just we spend all day communicating basically right like we do work but we talk about work we talk about plans the things we do and so on um and there is a lot of value and it's also compounding in a way that if you have a large team or if you have a lot of people reading what you write it only takes it you know for to be five percent better it's going to be massively beneficial for everybody because you're it's five percent better for every single person that's reading what you wrote so if that's 10 people that's you know a huge improvement right off the bat. Um, one of the things, and we're, we're um, eventually mm -hmm. ending, uh, reaching the end of our first episode, which has been super amazing, thanks to you. Um, one of the things that I'm I'm very bullish on and and quite stubborn is the 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 role that remote work, remote as a company, uh, all the remote companies, and the future of work play in diversity and, and, and inclusivity. What's mm -hmm. your take on this? How, how, how do you think that uh, this future of work is tackling or helping that? Or is it not? Or maybe it is the key thing that will help finally steer the world into the right direction? I don't think we're doing enough here. Uh, I think it's a bit disappointing. Uh, if I look, if I go uh, onto the websites of uh, remote teams that list their, their their team members. If I, you know, Duist is one of them. So I'm talking about ourselves too. Uh, Basecamp is another, uh, GitLab and so on. I see a very strong, uh, you know, there's the white males are very predominant. Uh, white people are very predominant. And, you know, in some cases the US is very predominant. So I think, you know, in theory we could be truly worldwide, but in practice that does not happen. Now, I don't, I don't think we need to, you know, just play the blame game and say, oh, yeah, it's, you know, uh, there's nothing we can do. Actually, there's a lot we can do. And that's, I think, what we should be focusing on. Um, and I'm a lot more interested in the actual uh, actions we can take. I've seen things like, you know, just reviewing the copy of our job postings to make sure they're inclusive. Uh, there's a, the way we promote uh, you know, new roles. There's the way we uh, promote internally also to have more diversity in leadership roles. Um, there's just a lot of things we can do to improve the situation, but I would say the status quo is 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 actually not great uh, because the world itself is diverse and we claim to be, right, like remote work, fully distributed teams, we claim to be working with the whole world, but then our sample size feels very biased in most cases. So not say, some folks do this well, but I do think most don't. Uh, and I find it a little disappointing. Um, so yeah, I'm unsure what to say there, but I do think we need action, you know, more than one action, uh, you know, realistic goals too. That's important. Like I, I do see a lot of people coming up with sometimes, you know, oh, diversity is bad. So let's, you know, bake quotas, yeah. let's say. That's really not what I think people should be doing, but instead focusing on how to reach and be appealing to all of the groups that are currently underrepresented. And this will often mean changing the culture, the internal culture to be more welcoming. And that's okay. That should be something that's celebrated because we're better than we were yesterday. But okay, I'm going on a rant here, but I do think um, 
there is this disconnect between the potential of what we could be in terms of diversity and what we really are when judging by the faces I can see on almost everybody's website. Agreed. I think we, we um, whatever work we put into, we'll only see the results in at least 10 years. Um, and the, the, the more we, more work we put into it, uh, just the better, I think we owe it to the world and to the generations, um, uh, that, um, are to come, um, mm -hmm. and exist already, um, to do way more than we're doing today. Um, and a hundred percent, uh, behind that. Now, one very last question from our mm -hmm. uh, audience. So, um, transparency, um, it can become overwhelming. Uh, in, in, in certain companies, in mm -hmm. a few different contexts. Um, how how mm -hmm. do you feel about this? Um, has it ever hurt you somehow, your teams? Uh, how do you feel about the level of some teams, some companies are like 100% transparent and then they slowly start removing that transparency. Uh, some teams are opaque from day one um, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, how, how do you feel about it? I'm a huge fan of transparency. Although I do think transparency needs to be done right. So um, let's say you use email to communicate. You're going to have a very bad time uh, because there's something we need to separate. These, there's, there are two ideas we need to separate. One is the idea that transparency means everybody has you know access to most things, basically. So they're there. They're searchable. You can find them. You can see them if you want to. Another idea which needs to be separate is that everybody gets notified about everything. And if you use email, these are the same things. If you communicate on, over email, right? You, if you want to make things transparent, you're going to need to annoy everybody, basically. But if you use a better tool, you, you can use Twist. We build Twist, so I'm a little biased. But there's more. Like You can use a handbook. To I know you guys do this like uh, as very intensely. There's discourse and so on. In, in these workflows, you can separate the two. You can make sure that the information is easily accessible and searchable by everybody. So everybody's empowered by this. And at the same time, you can manage who actually gets notified about things and make that laser focused. And I think that's that distinction is super important because most people are using email or Slack. And in those cases, it's much harder to bake this separation. But the separation is fundamental to making sure that transparency works and it's not overwhelming. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, and one last thing. Imagine you have like, a, I don't know, one sentence shot that you can send back in time, uh, either to you or um, yourself in the past or to someone that is actually starting their career as, as, as engineer, as a team leader, as manager. Um, you have you can send only one sentence, uh, either as a warning or as a motto. Um, what is it? One sentence. <laughs> you can think about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I am thinking about it. So uh, I, can oh, I, cannot, my, I, can, I cannot. I can sing a bit if you if you'd like. <laughs> you I would love to hear yours. <laughs> mine. Yes. Can I reverse this? And I will do. Yeah, mine, you, can. Sure. you can. You can. You <laughs> can. You can do whatever, but just be kind. Hmm. Okay, yeah, now I feel the pressure. That, that was fast. <laughs> okay, so if I could send a message into the past, it would be that the technology itself doesn't matter much. It's what we do with it. Nice. I think that would be applicable. I think we, we can end this episode on a very high note. Um, so, <laughs> Gonzalo, really appreciate you. Uh, Thank you so much. In the first yes. episode, loved all the things you said. Um, again, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone that joined um, us. We'll be running uh, this series monthly. Just click subscribe, register, whatever <laughs> this shows up. <laughs> And we'll be happy to show up on your radar. Uh, if mm -hmm. not, you'll still see a lot of our tweets and stuff about it. Masalo, again, thank you so yeah, much. No, it was great having you. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be number one. Can only go up from here. Well, actually, down. <laughs> you want this to go down, right? Like, that's the yes. point. So, yeah, I, I, I love the idea of uh, balancing out 
uh, the, all the fluff we see because there's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears behind everything. So yeah, amazing to be here. And uh, this was a nice conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Cheers.